Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming so early uh, to a very special event as part of the Galway Music Festival, the <coughs> Historical Harp Association of Ireland has brought its Discovery Day, Early Irish Harp Discovery Day, to Galway. Um, this is a, an event which will last between 11 and 2, and the first thing is this talk, which you've come to, and the second thing, at about 12, <coughs> quick changeover, is a recital by Roshin El Safdi and Sharon Armstrong. Siobhan Armstrong, oh my gosh. Siobhan Armstrong. <coughs> and um, that recital is something extremely special because you have one of the best Irish traditional singers in the Irish language, what we call Shandor singing, working with one of the best early Irish harpists now working in that area. And um, so I do really, if you at all can, to stay on for the, 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 the uh, recital. And then the last thing is a hands-on workshop. Now the hands-on workshop, there was a slight mistake in this little timetable in this. The hands-on workshop was a paid-in event and it's full for the hands-on, but if you want to observe, you're perfectly welcome to stay. So the first thing I have to do is to do the little emergency announcements. Um, the, do the emergency doors are, there's one over here at the back, and then there's the door that you came in. And if I can ask you all now to check your phones, make sure they're either turned off or on silent, I'd be very grateful. Um, and without further ado, I introduce Simon Chadwick, who's going to tell us all about the history of the early Irish harp. So we're here for this discovery day to find out all about the old Irish harp. And so my job, first of all, is to rattle through the history of everything there is to know about old, har old harps in old Ireland, which is not really possible in such a short amount of time. So what we're going to do is have a quick sky to the surface. And if you have any questions or if there's anything I've forgotten to talk about, please ask straight away, because we don't want to be talking about stuff that you're not interested in and missing out on stuff that you are interested in. So what I'm going to do to start with is we're going to do a quick history from earliest times. And the oldest harp things that you find in Ireland is these stone carvings. This is from one of the high crosses and there's a few of the high crosses have musical instruments and musicians shown on them. And it's kind of exciting because if you look at the far right hand side of the screen, it's the figure of Christ in the centre of the cross. And on his left hand, you have the dam, and you often get bagpipes being played. <laughs> <laughs> and on his right hand are the, the elect and the same, and of course, they have hearts. Um, well, they have sort of vaguely blob shaped things in front of them. And sometimes there's no stripes at the middle. And so, um, from our looking at the heart's point of view, you can say, great, excellent, a picture of a heart. And you can try and guess how big it is and, and how he's holding it and all this kind of thing. But at the end of the day, it's like a kind of cartoon that's been left outside in the rain for 1,200 years. So there's not much you can actually say about performance practice and about music or style. It's just... This, that's, that's all there is to see, is this seated figure with a blob in front of them. So, <clears throat> it's kind of the start, you know. I'm sure, I'm sure earlier than 1,200 years ago there were harps or stringed instruments in Ireland, but we don't really know much about them. We don't, we don't even know what shape of a blob they would have been. So, so this is where we start with this vague, it's like swimming into view through the mists of time. <laughs> And as time goes on, the mists kind of part and the, and the blob becomes more clearly defined. And you can see that by, by the time you get to a, a thousand years ago, it's got quite crisp and well shown. So here's the man sitting with the triangular, triangular stripy thing on his knee. Um, but you can see his fingers, you can see strings, you can see little metal fittings on the harp. You can even see... Up here, you can see the beginnings of the fish shape on the front of the harp, 
which you can see on the on on this one here. You can start you can start to say specific things about the design of the harp and the way that it's made. I mean, it's still a cartoon. It's just this one hasn't been left in the rain for thirty years, it's, and so and so it gets a little bit more clear. And you can start to compare him to similar drawings in England or on the continent, and start to understand about how Irish musical traditions start to come and develop. But it's all a little bit vague and, um, and up in the air. And it's not until you get to the 14th century that it suddenly all becomes real because there are actual, complete working musical instruments that survive from the 14th century. And these are the two best-known old harps. The one on the left is the famous Brian Baru harp, which is kept in Trinity College in Dublin. And the one on the right is the famous Queen Mary harp, which is kept in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. And I find this very interesting because they're kind of the same as each other. They have the same number of strings, they have the same shapes, they have the same kind of ergonomics, <coughs> they have the same kind of string lengths, which gives you the same kind of tuning. They even have the same overall decorative scheme. They both have this fish running up the front. They both have circles carved on them with heraldic beasts. And they both have the same, have kind of vine scrolls running up and down them. And the, the details of the kind of vine scrolls and the kind of beasts are very different so they're obviously made by different craftsmen or different workshops, but following the same idea of what a harp should be. And as far as you can tell, this is a kind of harp that's very specific to the Gaelic-speaking areas of Scotland and Ireland. And it's connected in historical sources to the higher arts, the, the bards, the professional musicians, the accompaniment of the formal bardic poetry. Now we don't know very much about how this accompaniment would work. We've got a lot of the poetry written into books, but they didn't write the accompaniment about it. And so we have these actual musical instruments that are actually played by old musicians, but we don't really know what they're playing on them. And, so, and there's a whole programme of research and work that's going on at the moment to try and understand what was played on these instruments, but you can't do it from a musical notation point of view because there isn't any. So there's a kind of scientific, archaeological approach. This picture shows the Queen Mary harp in Edinburgh. Here it is in the hospital scanning machine, and it generates very detailed inside views. And um, Dr. Taryn Loomis, who's part of the Harp Society, has been doing this work, analysing the tiny traces of pigment and paint and repair and decoration and the way the player's hands rub on the instrument. And you can build up a kind of archaeological picture of how these medieval harps were played. And this is an ongoing work, so we don't have any answers yet. We never will, but it's a, it's a fascinating research project. <coughs> but these are the earliest actual concrete harp things that we have. But we can carry on forward in time. And of course... <coughs> sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. This is, this is the kind of inside view that, that the scan generates, just so you can see how much detail there is and how many... We could spend the entire hour talking about this slide and pointing out things you can see on the scientific analysis. But as you go forward in time, you start to get more broad information about the harp tradition and how it works. So for example, this picture, this is not actually the harp in the picture, but it's the same kind of harp in the picture. It's big, bigger and beefier and sturdier than the little medieval harps. Because it's an oil portrait, you start to see very concrete things about it. how is he sitting, how is he holding his hand. You can, you can count the strings in the painting and you can, you can count his fingers work out which strings are his fingers on, what kind of melodic or chordal shapes are his hands making. And the other thing that you can do with this picture, or that you can in theory do with this picture, is the, the girl at the top in the middle is holding a piece of paper like this, just tilting it towards you. And on the piece of paper is musical notation. 
And so there you've got a direct connection between notated music and somebody playing the old Irish harp. Now the trouble is, is that I don't think any of us has got a, a photograph of this picture that's clear enough to read the notation. So it's very frustrating. You can see the lines, you can see the dots, but you can't work out what they're saying. So this is a future research project for somebody to try and read the tune and play it on the harp with a harp of this type holding it in this way with their fingers on those strings. Is there a match between the notation, the tune, and the fingers? So like I say, it's a work in progress. There's a lot we, we, we don't know more than we do know but we're starting to get ideas of what we want to know and how we might go about playing it out. But we are history, and so history rolls on, and so we carry on through time. And as time moves on, things get more and more clear and explicit. So this is the famous harper and composer, Ter Caroan. Everybody knows him as a harper and a composer, but really, he was a singer and a songwriter. First of all, he composed songs in Irish for his patrons. And he would go to their houses and he would sing them to them. And that was his thing. And he accompanied himself on the harp. And on the left here, this is traditionally said to be one of his harps. And I've been doing a huge research project on this harp and on its provenance. And I think it's right. I think it really is his harp. And um, there's a lot of technical study that you can do of the harp to find out how it was made, how it was broken, how it was repaired, how it was used, how it was tuned. And then the book at the bottom was published by Caroline's son. And so this gives us quite a direct connection to Caroline's tunes. You start to get, you can get more and more specific. These are the tunes that the son published. I think the son had the harp, and it gives you a connection into to Caroline as a composer of music. But again, this is a, an ongoing research project, so if you ask me a question about it, I'll probably say, I don't know. But I'm working on it. May I have a quick question? I'm just curious of the material used for the string. Okay, the strings of these harps are always made of metal. Right back to metal. the earliest times. This is the Irish tradition. It's to put metal strings on a harp. And you'll hear in the concert what the sound results of this. I don't know if you want to learn that. But this is, this is the thing that marks out Irish harps as different from harps in other countries. So it's all metal. Yeah. Not, not so other. Typically brass. Brass. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> and that is one of the things that defines this tradition all the way through. So thank you for asking, because I should have said that. But I think you can see this, this harp still has old strings on it. You can see they're <coughs> old metal wires that are all a bit jangly. Because, of course, a harp like this in the, in the museum, you can't string it and tune it and play it. For one thing, it's in the museum, they're not going to let anybody yeah. do that. But also because it's hundreds of years old, it's very fragile. And this is a problem for us. So if, if you're studying, say, early harpsichords or early violins, there are instruments that are in playing condition. You, there are harpsichords you can find from the 18th century that you can play, or violins. And there are no Irish harps from that time that are in working order. Okay. And again, this is the thing that we'll get to later, yeah? Is it strung then? Yeah, it's got strings on, but then you can see they're not, they're slack, they're no, not up to tension. Are they original strings? Or, hmm? or they, are they original strings? I don't know. Um, some of them, possibly, yeah. This is part of the, part of the study, is to work out. that there, there definitely are old hearts with old strings on, but they're not up to tension, and you couldn't put them up to tension without damaging and breaking everything. <coughs> So, can I just ask you one? Yeah. Just, I, I'm curious about the uh, audio photographs showing the left hand playing the trail. Yes. Um, is, uh, at what point did that, did that change? Or uh, Well, in the, Irish, in the old Irish tradition, it didn't change. That was another thing that defines the old Irish tradition is the, is the left hand of the treble and the right hand of the bass. That and the metal strings are the things you see right from the beginning, right from, those, from the little medieval cartoon. He had his left hand on the treble right through to Caroline and later. But we'll get a little bit to what happened more recently, because we're, we're, you know, we're in history mode, so we have to doggedly plough through centuries of time. 
So as we move further forward in time, by the end of the 18th century, so this is a little bit over 200 years ago, the last generation of old Irish harpers was alive. And this is an interesting thing. Why are they the last generation? We'll come back to that. But these are the... This is a, an example of harpers who were alive a little bit over 200 years ago. And then at the bottom is a selection of harps in the National Museum in Dublin that were in use at that time. They're not in use now, they're one in the museum. So at the top left we've got Arthur O'Neill, and I think Siobhan will talk about him, and because he's on the cover of the uh, concept programme for today. The next man, we don't know who he is. People make claims as to who they think he is, and I don't think there's any grounds to make those claims. The third man, we don't know who he is. Some people make claims about who he is, but I don't think they were very sensible. The man at the far right-hand side is called William Carr, and he was learning to play the harp in about 1790, 1800. He was, I think he really was the very last harper in the old tradition before it all came to an end. And then at the bottom here we have these harps in the museum. And the harps that we have lined up on the floor, which are for the workshop at one o'clock, these are all copied, simplified copies of harps that are in the museum. So to, to bring it back to life again, <coughs> this is connected to this thing, you can't get the harps out of the museum and play them. And so we have to have these copies made of them to, to bring them back to life. So at the end of the 18th century was like a kind of, in some ways it was a decline of the tradition, and in some ways it was a high point, because we, have, we start to have very precise information. So here's a portrait of Patrick Quinn, one of, the, one of these old harpers. You can see he lived on into the 19th century, and his harp, after he died, was kept, and is now in Trinity College. And so it's quite interesting to look at his portrait and to look at the harp, and you can, you can start to match up, like, the obvious thing is the way his hands are resting on the harp. If you go to Trinity College and look at the harp, you can see the, the wood is rubbed in exactly those places. And so you start to get this quite visceral connection to him and to his practice. And another of the old harpers that we have that kind of information for is Dennis Ahampsey, or Dennis Hempson. And here he is sitting, blind, 100 years old, very grumpy, as you would be if you were blind and 100 years old. And his harp, after he died, was kept and preserved by a patron, and is now in the Guinness Museum in Dublin. And so you can see here, there's his harp in the Guinness Museum, being admired by members of the Historical Heart Society of Ireland on one of our field trips. That would be the harp for Guinness, ah, you know, the Guinness symbol. No, it's not the harp on the Guinness symbol. That's, that's a very long and complicated story. The harp on the Guinness symbol is in Trinity College. Right. Um, I think what happened was that Guinness was a bit jealous and they wanted a harp, and, this, and Dennis and Hampsey came for sale, and they said, well, we'll have that. Right. You know, it's near enough, and nobody knows the difference. But well, we do. <laughs> do, we we know, do we know when Guinness bought this In the harp? 60s, I think. Right. And presumably the, the harp symbol they had was from 1769 yeah, when Guinness was founded. Right. Yeah. So, so there's a big, little, little so it should be, but it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. But still, they've got it and they preserve it, and it's just part of the, part of the story. And they, and they show it in their publicity and advertising gallery, because it's an old Irish harp, and that's what their symbol is. So there's, there's a lot of that kind of vagueness goes on in old Irish harp studies. People, people love being vague and getting it slightly wrong and just sort of glossing over the details. And this is one of our missions, is to say, no, wait, this, this, and this. And you go, oh, right. It's much more interesting and complicated and subtle and beautiful than everybody thought. <coughs> Now, at the end of the 18th century, in the 1790s, Edward Bunting burst onto the scene. Now, Edward Bunting um, is a very interesting man. He's a church organist in Belfast. He's classically trained. I think he was a bit of a musical genius um, in that he was kind of super literate and he could listen and write down very accurately what he was hearing, even if it was unfamiliar to him. A little bit like Mozart, you know, the, the story is about him being young and listening and playing stuff back. I think Bunting has a little bit of that. And so when Bunting was a teenager, 
the, all the last, this last generation of partners, the people I've just been showing you, Patrick Quinn and Dennis Hapsey and William Carr and Arthur O'Neill, they were all gathered together in Belfast in 1792 to, to save the old music, to come together to play their tunes. And to save it, because you couldn't record it, you couldn't have a video camera or an audio recorder at that date, so to save it, what do you have to do? You have to write it down. And so teenager Edward Bunting was employed by the organisers to come to sit and to write down what the harpers were playing. And he did it on that day, and he realised that the harpers had so much music, so much tradition, and they were all old. I mean, Dennis Hansen was over 100 years old. He obviously wasn't going to last very long. And so, and so Bunting then went off on collecting tours for the next few years. He visited harpers at home, he sat beside them, and he wrote down their tunes live from what they played. So here's, here's how it works. Edward Bunting goes down to um, County Armagh. He sits down beside Patrick Quinn. Patrick Quinn plays a tune. And Edward Bunting scribbles into his tiny little pocket book. And I hope you can see on the projection, it's a pretty awful scribble. I mean, it's, it's almost illegible. But this is, this is literally Patrick Quinn's strumming away playing a tune. Edward Bunting's like, and he, just and he gets it wrong, and he scribbles it out, and he writes underneath, and goes around the corner, and all this kind of thing. And then he goes home, and he takes his book, and he copies what he's just transcribed neatly onto a piano staff, and then he starts to think. Because one thing is a pianist, he starts adding basses, he starts adding harmonies, he goes to tune with the tune would fit the bass better if I had a bit of sharp so I turn the tune this way. And eventually, he publishes it. And once it publishes it, the music is saved because it's in print and people are playing the tunes. So this is the process. But I guess if you're interested in tunes or if you're interested in a sort of saving the national music project, then the whole arrangement and publishing mission is interesting. But if you're interested in what the old harpers are playing, just that first stage is key. And the thing that, that is so special for us is that some of the things field books, these little transcript books, survive you know, in Queen's University. And this is one of them. And this, this is the one where he sat down beside Patrick Quinn and transcribed live from Quinn's play. So this book is like, is like the, the field recording, the archive. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Bunting, Bunting went out to McGilligan on the north coast of County Derry and visited Dennis Ahamsey at his cottage there. And Dennis Ahamsey played, and Edward Bunting scribbled into a different notebook. And so this is the field transcript book from the playing of Dennis Ahamsey. And, you, and I think Dennis Ahamsey was older, and his, maybe he wasn't such a good performer, because he was 100 years old, and um, Bunting struggled to get his tunes more. So you can see at the top left-hand corner, Bunting started writing, and he does kind of two bars, and then it just kind of dribbles to a halt. And instead, he just doodles, because he's just gone, oh, this is too much. And a few pages later, he starts again, and he manages to get the whole tune. So it's lovely to see that working method, to imagine, what, imagine the conversations between these two men, and what, and a house is blind, and Bunting's a teenager, so you imagine him pulling funny faces and sniggering the funny old man with a hunchback. And, and, um, and Hamsey's saying something, and Bunting's saying, wow, we're writing it down. And I just try and imagine what, this, what the dynamic was. And there were multiple visits. And Bunting obviously was fascinated by this old man, sort of a dinosaur from a different world. Now, as well as collecting, writing down, publishing, Another strand of the work that the Belfast men were all interested in, and Bunting was involved in this, is they thought, well, it's all very well writing down and publishing the books. What about the tradition? What about the connection between master and student that was obviously coming to an end? These, these old men, there was Hansi, Patrick Quinn, they, they had learned from masters, had learned from masters, going right back into the mists of times. It's a living tradition and they didn't have any students. So the tradition was obviously going to come to an end. And so what the Belfast people did was they set up a harp society, and they set up a school. 
and they got one of the old men, Arthur O'Neill, here he is sitting under a tree. He, Arthur O'Neill was a teacher at the school. This would be in 1809, I think it was first set up. And so Arthur O'Neill went to Belfast, set himself up in a schoolhouse, and taught a, a load of young men to play the harp. And it was a charitable society, and so the young, the young boys that were recruited were blind boys, they were poor. So in some ways it was quite contrived. You know, these, these are not people who are actively wanting to learn the harp. They're, they're people who are kind of poverty-stricken and with no hope in life, and so the charitable school is getting them and giving them a way to make their living in a respectable 19th century way. This is one of the most famous of the boys who come out of the Belfast School, Patrick Byrne. <clears throat> he wasn't taught by Arthur O'Neill, he came a little bit later. After Arthur O'Neill died, one of the other society boys, one of his students, then became master. And he taught Patrick Byrne. But Patrick Byrne then has this lineage. He was taught by Edward McBride, who was taught by Arthur O'Neill. And Arthur O'Neill, of course, was taught by Owen, by Owen Keenan, who was one of the old harpers, and so this lineage goes right back into the midst of time as a, as a lineage in the old living tradition. So here's Patrick Byrne. He's still playing a harp with metal wire strings. He's still, he's got his left hand in the treble and his right hand in the bass, because that's how you play an old Irish harp. Patrick Byrne did very well. I think he was a good businessman and a good self-promoter as well. And so he toured in England. He got the attention of the Queen. He became the official royal harper to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. And he went to Edinburgh, where his photograph was taken. The first photograph ever of an Irish traditional musician, supposedly. I mean, photography had only been invented a few years when Patrick Byrne sat for this portrait. Anyway, when he was in Edinburgh, a reviewer heard him play, and we had a very interesting book review. It's a review of one of Bunting's books. And the reviewer just talks about Patrick Byrne and says, if we could judge at all from one instance, we would say that an Irish harper may yet be a respectable person. <laughs> a worthy representative of the fraternity, Mr. Patrick Byrne, a pupil of the Belfast Academy, is a well-informed, modest, an agreeable man of perfectly virtuous habits, as well as a delightful performer on his instrument. <coughs> to be describing you, Siobhan. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> what about we, the sorority? You can talk about the fraternity. What about the sorority? <laughs> we had the great pleasure of hearing him about three years ago in Edinburgh, where he attended private parties for a moderate fee and was generally esteemed. And then the reviewer carries on and says some very, some very interesting things about the music and about the harp. And it gives you a little, it starts to give you a window into, you ask this question, when did things change? Well, this is when things were actively changing, but it's an incredibly complicated story. It's one of the most difficult things for us to think about, to get our heads around. So our reviewer continues, let it not be supposed that the Irish music may nevertheless be preserved and played on other instruments. No one who has heard the Irish harp could imagine such a thing. When we hear Moore's Irish melodies played on the pianoforte, or even on the pedal harp, we do not hear the same music which a Cahan, Carolan, or Hempson played. It is as much altered as Homer in the translation of Pope. <coughs> For the true presentment of this music to modern ears, we require the old sets as preserved by Bunting and the Irish harp played by an Irish harper. This instrument, it must be remembered, is of peculiar structure. It contains about 30 brass wires, the twang of which give the music a striking metallic brilliancy. The high notes are given with the left hand, reserving the more powerful member for the deep notes of the bass. 
So he described quite coherently what the difference is between the Irish harp and the pedal harp. And for a while I find this kind of interesting. That's an interesting distinction to make. He's very insistent that the Irish harp, you can see on the right, an Irish harp made for the Irish Harp Society by John Egan in Dublin. And this is, this is the same as the harp that Patrick Byrne has in his portrait. It has metal wire strings and it's set up in the old system and the old tuning for the students of Arthur O'Neill. And on the left, we've got a pedal harp made by John Egan in Dublin. So these are both harps made by John Egan. And these are, these are two of the harp types of harps that he made. And I find it kind of interesting that in this reviewer's mind, this is the two possible harp choices <coughs> that you can make. Because, of course, nowadays, we used to think of a third type of harp that we think of as a modern Irish harp. You're, because you, you mentioned the tuning, I'm wondering maybe you could say something about the tuning. Because I don't see any levers on these, and I'm wondering how they are tuned. Yeah, well, this is a big difference. So, the, so a pedal harp, both of these kind of harps, basically, they're tuned to the white notes of a modern piano scale. Okay, so there's no sharps and flats. Just, and that, just the natural notes. Now, on the pedal harp, this is why it's called a pedal harp, because it has pedals at the bottom, and the pedals connect to a mechanism, and the mechanism pinches the strings and makes them sharp. Okay, so you press the pedals and you get sharps and flats all over the place and you can change key as much as you like. But the Irish harp with metal wire strings doesn't have anything like that. It just gives you the notes, the white notes of the scale. And the tunes are all based on those notes. You don't need sharps and flats. In old Irish harp music, no, no, no. So there's this sort of no evidence of like, old Irish modes. Yeah, there's lots of evidence of old Irish modes and they all work on a on a basis. I'm simplifying massively, and Sharon will talk a little bit more about this in her concert, which will demonstrate a bit of retuning. But basically, the old Irish harp music doesn't require a harp with lots of sharps and flats. It's not necessary. You need a mechanism to give you lots of sharps and flats and a pedal harp to play classical music. Because classical music really does need lots of sharps and flats to change key and back to the source of all this kind of thing. Now, John Egan, who made both of these harps, he started making pedal harps. He made the Irish harps with metal strings for the harp societies in harp society Belfast. But he also was a mad inventor, a marketing genius and a an technical genius. And he realised that there was people who thought pedal harp was not suitable for old Irish music. For example, our reviewer, who slates the whole idea. And, and yet people who had classical training and were, interested, were in a classical music world, in an Anglo-Dublin world, and who would have no concept of how to play an old Irish harp and metal strings. So what Egan did, very cleverly, was made something that looked Irish, but worked in a classical way. So, so uh, Egan's portable harp has gut strings, like a pedal harp. It has a little mechanism at the top to pinch all the strings to give you all the sharps and flats that you could dream of. Organised from little finger buttons instead of from pedals, because that's just because it's wee. And so anybody who could play a pedal harp could play it. And I even have an advertisement that I'll read to you. This is John Egan advert, right? This new, improved, portable Irish harp, invented by John Egan. Pedal harp maker, John Egan most respectfully <coughs> solicits the attention of the nobility and the musical world to his newly invented portable Irish harp. These beautiful instruments are strung with gut. The ancient Irish harp was strung with wire, he says in his little footnote. <coughs> strung with gut, played with both hands and in all the keys of the pedal harp, possessing great brilliancy and all the sweetness of tone of the pedal harp. They stand in tune remarkably well and seldom break a string. All pedal harp music can be played on them and they are a delightful accompaniment to the voice or pianoforte and most convenient for travelling or taking a dwarf. They are particularly desirable to proficients on the pedal harp as it is not necessary for them to take lessons to enable them to play on these portable harps because the strings, tuning, fingering, etc., are exactly the same as the pedal harp. <coughs> and though possessing all the general advantages of that instrument, is not one third of the price. These interesting harps have been patronized by ladies of the first rank. 
And that this new delicate approbation of professors of the first consideration. There are different prices, as in number one, two, three, then he gives his price in the description of them. But it's very interesting, he's very specifically marketing this new, small, gut strung Irish harp with mechanism. He's marketing it to people who are in that Anglo classical world, able to play pedal harp, learning from pedal harp teachers. And this, this is how it all changed. Okay? That the last generations, like Patrick Byrne, playing on the old wives from harp, they just couldn't keep going. They, they didn't have the structures of tuition and patronage. Whereas fashionable metropolitan Anglo Dublin types moving moving in society with ladies of the first rank <laughs> and with the money to buy a pedal harp, they could have these new portable that strong Irish harps and use them for classical Thomas Moore Irish melody type arrangements of the harp music. And so can you see that this is this is when the shift happened. And it wasn't that there was a change and that the old harp was moved on to new harps, it was that the old harp tradition died a death and almost Simultaneously, a newly invented sort of Anglo continental classical passage sprung fully formed onto the scene and gobbled everything up in its path. It's much more portable than the pedal. Yeah, well, that, this is one of the things that he says. It's a third of the price. And very portable. I mean, wouldn't you buy one? <laughs> so so Eagle was very good. He, he was a good inventor. It worked very well. He marketed it well. And it took over. Okay, so the old Irish harp died, vanished completely, and the new Anglo classical substitute took over across the board and is still going strong today. Coffee is a drop, if you like. <coughs> His workshop is a coffee. It's a coffee. Mm. <coughs> oh, there's the advert, which I've already read to you, so I don't need to show you again. So, so the replacement was so successful, but the time you get, here's 1903, in Belfast, the same Linen Hall Library, the same institution that organised Bunting to write down the music of the old harpers, the same organisation that organised Arthur O'Neill to teach a new generation of young blind boys to keep the real old lineage going, playing on the metal strings and all that kind of thing. That same organisation, when it organised an Irish Harp Festival in 1903, We have people like Floria Connor playing on basically a miniature classical harp with gut strings. And you, can, you can see the mechanism along the top of her harp. And she made recordings in 1907. And you can hear her playing style. It's just very classical, very chordal, and not in the old tradition at all. And it's kind of interesting how complete Eden's innovations had completely moved to cover. <coughs> yeah? I want to say one other thing about the change in tradition, I don't know if anybody noticed, from all male, almost all male harpers, it's all women. Well, that's a good point as well. So, Gloria Connor is, is, is the first woman we've seen in the heart, and she's in the, she's in the, new, the, the new Anglo classical tradition. And I think that's, that's part of the Anglo classical thing, is that the pedal harp in London and Paris was very much a woman's instrument. And the whole Irish harp with Arthur Neil and Kate Tyrone and Patrick Quinn in Portadown was very much a man's thing. But, but not exclusively. No, because well, neither, neither, neither is exclusively. Harp, exclusively. Harp, right? Right? Not, not, not nothing is exclusive, exclusive, no. But as a general as general rule, rule, yeah. So, yeah, this, this, is, this is true. It's, it's, it's a complete cultural package. They're, they're, they're two complete cultural packages and they're completely dissociated with. So there's no connection between them. And, and, I, and I think that's a very simplistic answer. I'm, I'm actively I'm looking for a connection. I'm actively looking for somebody who learns in the old tradition from one of the old guys and then switch to switch. And I have been looking for a few years now and I'm still actively looking. If I find one, I'll be really thrilled, but I haven't yet. Now, <clears throat> we're all sitting here thinking, okay, we get it. The modern Irish harp with gut strings and mechanised is not the old tradition. And it's different. When you think, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, what do we do next? And people have been thinking that almost since the 
on these materials. Okay? So James McFall, who was making the classical style harps, he made Floria Connor's harp. James McFall got this, and this is his attempt to make an old style harp, except he didn't have a clue. But uh, he deflated his best, so you can see it's, a, it's not floor sandy, it's got this little curly foot like the Brian Drew harp, it's got metal wire strings. And this is a harp that's in the Harp Society collections. It doesn't, basically doesn't work very well, but, he, but he, he tried, and he advertised these, but this is the only one I've ever seen, and so I'm thinking that just nobody bought them, and the market wasn't right at the time. Um, in the 1890s, in Scotland, they started the whole mod festival movement, which is Gaelic song and arts. And the organisers, right from the very beginning in 1892, wanted harps. They wanted the class to accompany Gaelic singing. And so they sent off to um, uh, an instrument maker who was a scholar on old instruments in Edinburgh. And he went to the museum and he looked at the old harps and he made an archaeological copy. Very good with a solid carved one-piece willow sound box and with the metal work and with the brass wire strings and everything. And these ladies, who were Gaelic singers, who had learned to play the pedal harp, they tried to play them. And it basically, as far as I can see, it didn't work. Because you can't play a replica medieval Irish harp with pedal harp technique and style. In idiom, it doesn't work. It's referred to independent separate work. And so this photograph is from the mod in 1892. And there she is with her archaeological reproduction medieval harp. And in 1893, they got Eden style harps with gut strings and semitone mechanisms and never looked back, basically. So it was a little attempt to do it right, to get the real old creative traditions up and running. And within a year, they go, no, forget that. Don't, 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 don't get it. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's shocking how quickly you know how you can try it doesn't work and I think the interesting thing is is that Glenn the instrument maker really got it and he made good Irish old Irish harps but nobody had a clue what to do with them there was no concept of playing technique style idiom any of that because they, they were completely in a classical headspace for their repertory and style and technique. Um, Henebury, <coughs> down in County Waterford, was very interested in old Irish music. He did um, audio recordings on cylinders of traditional singers and this kind of thing. And, and he studied modes and scales. And he made this harp, or had it made for him, but I don't know, he played the harp, and I, I've never heard of anybody playing this, this one. But again, it's a good archaeological copy of the Brian Rue harp. But what do you do with it once you've got it? You know, it's no use it's just having the instrument. You have to have a system, a, a technique for playing it as well. <coughs> Arnold Dolmetsch, the father of early music in um, the southeast of England, uh, he was getting to be an old man by the 1930s, and he had his list of all the things that he wanted to do before he died. And so between that 1930 and 1939, when he finally died, he raced along doing as much as he could. And so it's, it's kind of like, done that, tick it off, move on to the next thing, all kinds of different things. And one of the things was ancient harp music. And he was approached by a Scottish harpist who was interested in ancient, and tradition, ancient music and said, can you make me an ancient <coughs> Irish harp? And this is, this is the kind of thing he came up with. And um, it's vaguely based on the Brian Baru harp. It's a bit lighter and slender. I'm not sure that Arnold Dolmet even visited the museum and looked at the real thing, I think, which is working from pictures. But he fitted it with wire strings like a harpsichord. And this is a, another lady in Scotland who got hold of one in the 1930s and played it. Um, and she worked out playing technique. She put it on the left side, um, but she didn't really get much into the style of the idiom. She was still playing sort of classical, Marjorie Kennedy phrases, classical arrangements of Gaelic songs, which was mainly singing and using it just to, as an accompaniment instrument. So there was a little bit of work done in the 30s, but not that much, and it didn't necessarily go anywhere. And partly because Arnold Dolmich was a good instrument maker, but he wasn't a good 
archaeologist or archaeological or organologist, and so he didn't, his instruments are not considered good instruments nowadays. So the, the one that's photographed here, I have it, and I've restored it and set it up, but it doesn't really work out well in the old tradition. You know, it speaks so beautifully, but it's hard to play historical side on it. But he's trying. Uh, Chris Warren. I think Chris Warren was around in the 1960s, and I'm sorry my photograph of him is so awful, but I haven't been able to find a better one. And um, he, he had an Egan harp, which is now in the Harp Society's collection, but he knew that the, the Egan portable harp is not the old Irish harp, and so he went to, he looked at the, Trin at the harp in Trinity College, the Brian Brew harp, and he made himself a copy of it. And he made plans and sold them. And so there's a few other people made harps based on his plans. You can see the part of his plans on the right there. And then he worked out how to play. You can see he's holding it on the left side. And he's thinking about tuning. And he's thinking about the nicety of the tuning that Bunting wrote down. And he's thinking about what Bunting wrote and what he said. And <coughs> Chris Warren, I think, went further than other people in engaging with the style of repertory. And here's a lovely notice that I just recently found from 1973, the next meeting, an Edward Bunting evening to mark the bicentenary of Bunting's birth. Uh, Alf McLaughlin discusses Bunting's work, speak on Bunting and songs in Irish, and then the Rev Chris Warren will speak on harp music in the Bunting collection. So this is like starting to really engage with our historical sources and apply them to reproduction instruments. So you can see, as time goes on, people, people kind of push a little bit further. But it's very difficult when you're working on your own. Nope. <clears throat> I'm, out, I'm all out of order. Anne Heyman was next. <laughs> she was around in the 1970s, perhaps. I think from the 1970s on, more people started going. So Granny Yates was probably starting about the same time that Anne Hayman was, maybe a little bit later. And people started to talk to each other. Um, and Paul Dooley was starting not long after that. I think he was beginning to be interested in the 70s. Um, and Derek Bell. And I don't have time to look at everybody. I can't show you everybody. But once you get here, it, it all starts to pick up. But Anne was very influential, talked to a lot of people and showed her work to a lot of people and shared it. So a lot of people have been influenced by Anne subsequently. And you can see one of the things that Anne did from the beginning that was slightly different to everybody else. Everybody we've seen so far in this revival has been using copies of the Brian Maru harp, the medieval harp. And Anne's first harp was a copy of Patrick Quinn's harp one of the harps used by the very last generation. So Anne was working on Bunting's manuscripts with a record there, a copy of one of the harps played by one of Bunting's informants. So she started out with this harp on the left, which is a copy of Patrick Quinn's harp. On the right is what she replaced it with, a fancy copy of Quinn's harp. <coughs> Later she did the same thing with Dennis Hampsey on the downhill harp. And I think this is my attempt at summarising this working method that you have. You have the harp, you have, you have a copy of one of the harps in the museums, you look at the portrait of the person playing that actual harp to work out the economics, and then you look at Bunting's transcript of them playing on that harp, and that gives you the notice to play. And that very specific connection between a specific harp, the specific portrait of the harp, specific transcription of their playing is, a, is, the, is where we're at just at the moment. This is, this is our current work, trying to really be specific and reconstruct these specifics. And here's Dennis Hampsey. And again, you can do the same process. Dennis Hampsey, his heart, the downhill heart in the museum, and Bunting's transcription of his playing. And this is where we end up, with people sitting with replicas of the heart, studying tuned after the manuscripts. That was a discovery day here this in Galway. discovery day here in Galway last year. And so I'll try and do the same again in a little bit. Thank you very much. <laughs>